Order, please. Just before we begin with the daily routine, I just have a, a brief message from Hansard to pass along to all members uh, when we are making introductions or mentioning uh, proper names of guests uh, or referring to somebody in a resolution. If you could just make sure to table uh, the uh, a document that has the proper spelling of those names uh, for purposes of Hansard. Been a bit challenging in the last couple of days. Uh, so just a nice uh, message from Hansard, a reminder to all of us. We'll now begin with the daily routine, beginning with presenting and reading of petitions. The Honourable Member for Bedford. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to table a petition. The operative clause reads as follows. We, the undersigned, petition the Legislative Assembly of Nova Scotia to ensure that women who require a full or partial breast prosthesis as a result of a growth defect or due to surgery as a result of breast cancer receive full MSI coverage for required breast prosthesis every two years. There are 889 signatures affixed on this, and I have affixed my own. The petition is tabled. Presenting reports of committees, tabling reports, regulations, and other papers, statements by ministers, government notices of motion. The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, may I do an introduction? Permission granted. I'd like to draw the attention of the House uh, to the East Gallery. We have joining us today is Kaylee Dixon from Dartmouth. <laughs> Kaylee, <laughs> Kaylee is one of our Provincial uh, Volunteer of the Year in 2019. She, some of you would also know her uh, from her work around the spoken word and many of her volunteer activities. Today, Kaylee will be taking part in presenting in a series of events recognizing the International Day of the Girl at Mount St. Vincent later this morning. So Kaylee, if you would please stand and receive the warm welcome of the House. Premier. I hereby give notice in a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas we as Nova Scotians are fortunate to have many throughout our province who are committed to making a positive impact in communities through, through volunteering and activism, and whereas Dartmouth's own Kaylee Dixon, a young Nova Scotian, has spent hundreds of hours of her own time volunteering in, in her community with organizations such as Take Action Society or Stop the Violence, and whereas Kaylee goes even further with her own initiatives being it her spoken word poetry to give voice to those who may have none, or her effort to address food insecurity and period poverty, she has more than earned her recognition as a 2019 Provincial Volunteer of the Year. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this House of Assembly join me today on International Day of the Girl in thanking Kaylee Dixon for her leadership, dedication and service she has given to her community and to her province. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? Agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye? Aye. Contrary-minded, nay. The motion is carried. <laughs> the Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the United Nations has marked October 11th as the International Day of the Girl to highlight and address the needs and challenges girls face while promoting girls' uh, empowerment and the fulfillment of their human rights. And whereas Nova Scotia believes in ensuring girls have access to opportunities to pursue their educational and career goals in any industry they choose. And whereas empowered young girls grow into strong women who make significant contributions to the economy, to the workforce, and to the economic success of our province and our country. Therefore, be it resolved that this House recognize the women as leaders at the Department of Finance and Treasury Board on this International Day of the Girl. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye? aye. Contrary-minded, nay? The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister responsible for the status of women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. May I make an introduction? Permission granted. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I would direct the members' attention to the East Gallery, where we are joined today by Sarah Dobson, who hey. is please stand, uh, who is a third-year student at the Schulich School of Law, and her friend Grace Evans, who is a third-year political science student, also at Dalhousie University. Uh, uh, the women leaders in this chamber may recognize Sarah and Grace, not just because Sarah was a page, but because they're in the process of interviewing. <laughs> 
interviewing current and past women MLAs to publish a book about all women ever elected to the Nova Scotia Legislature, I would ask my colleagues to give them a warm welcome. Yay! The Honourable Minister responsible for the status of women. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas over the course of Nova Scotia's rich history, the number of women elected each election to the House of Assembly has increased so that young women can better see themselves reflected in their elected leaders. And whereas Sarah Dobson and Grace Evans, students at Dalhousie University, are writing a book about all 50 women who have ever served as MLAs in the Nova Scotia Legislature, to hear their stories and pass on their wisdom and advice to the next generation of women leaders. And whereas upon completion, the proceeds from the book will be used to create a scholarship opportunity for young women in the province who aspire to enter a career in politics. Therefore, be it resolved, the members of this House of Assembly join me in recognizing Sarah and Grace for taking on this important project and wish them success as they gather the incredible stories of past and present women MLAs for the benefit of all Nova Scotian women. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favor of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. Aye. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Nova Scotians deserve an effective and user-friendly maintenance enforcement program, and our program serves over 13,000 families with women comprising over 95% of the recipients, and whereas we have made many recent improvements to this program, including launching a new mobile online system which provides better and more convenient service to our clients, and a new and innovative community outreach pilot project in Cape Breton, which is helping to get more payments into the hands of women and children, including those in Indigenous communities. And whereas innovative initiatives like these have helped reduce arrear levels to their lowest amount in over 10 years, and are resulting in the collection and payout of $230,000 each day to Nova Scotia families. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this House join me in recognizing the work done by the Maintenance Enforcement Program staff and their partners who are dedicated to ensuring Nova Scotian women and their families have financial stability. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and pass it without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Communities, Culture and Heritage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Nova Scotia continues to be a leader in the promotion of women and girls in sport and recreation, both government and the private sector, and whereas female representation on provincial sport organization boards in Nova Scotia is almost 10% above the national average, and Communities, Culture and Heritage is currently creating a gender equity action plan to support access and opportunities for sport, recreation and physical activity for all Nova Scotians. And whereas highlighting women and girls in sport through events such as the Women's World Hockey Championship, St. Francis Xavier showcasing women's rugby during homecoming and the Trendsetter Awards hosted by Women Active Nova Scotia encourages young girls to remain active and continues to pave the way for equal opportunities for women and girls in sport and recreation. Therefore, be it resolved that the House recognize the efforts of both government and the private sector in advancing the participation of women and girls in sport and in champion the continued efforts needed to equalize the playing field. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice, passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye, aye. Contrary-minded, nay. Motion is carried. <clears throat> the Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Mr. Speaker, permission to make an introduction. Permission granted. Today in our East Gallery, we are joined by Candice Bourgeois and Catherine Marriott, who were members of the Pathways to Shipbuilding Women Unlimited class that graduated from NSCC this past May. They were hired as welder and metal fabricator apprentices at Irving Shipyards. I ask them both to rise and receive the warm welcome of the House.
The Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas it is important to foster an environment where women feel empowered to enter a career of their choosing, and whereas the Pathways to Shipbuilding Women Unlimited is creating opportunities for young women to launch successful careers in Nova Scotia's shipbuilding industry. Whereas with our partners, this government is supporting a culture change in workplaces to remove barriers for women entering, staying, advancing, and succeeding in their skilled trades. Therefore, be resolved that all members of this legislature congratulate Candace and Catherine on their success and recognize the many organizations across our province that champion diverse and welcoming workplaces. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favor of the motion please say aye? aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion is carried. <laughs> the Honourable Minister of Immigration. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Rafaela Borja, Foluki Akin Kunmi, and Elena Faley, who identify as first generation immigrants, are on a mission to share a message of feminism globally. And whereas these three young girls have founded G Inspire 360, an Instagram and YouTube account that uses a girl talk series to discuss topics that are important to them, spreading their positive message and allowing them the opportunity to share their own experiences relating to stereotypes about their backgrounds, gender, and more. And whereas by creating change on one video at a time, these girls are inspiring others to open up about their own experiences and assisting to challenge these biases and stereotypes. Therefore, be it resolved that on this International Day of the Girl, all members recognize Rafaela, Faluki, and Elena for their remarkable efforts in spreading hope, a message of feminism, and acceptance, and overall girl power. Mr. Speaker, I ask for a waiver of notice in passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favor of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of the Public Service Commission. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day, I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas October 11th is the United Nations International Day of the Girl, a youth-led movement fighting for gender justice and youth rights, and whereas the government of Nova Scotia is committed to gender equity diversity and inclusion in the public service and in our workplaces. And whereas over half of Nova Scotia employees are women and we promote careers in government to girls and young women through events such as Take Our Kids to Work Day and Government Career Fair. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of the House of Assembly, please, House of Legislature, never mind. <laughs> Recognize October 11, 2019 as International Day of the Girl and encourage girls and young women to choose careers in the public service where they can play a role in shaping important public policy. Mr. Speaker, I ask for a waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. We'll now move on to introduction of bills. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I beg leave to make an introduction. Permission granted. Uh, direct uh, my colleagues' uh, attention to the East Gallery, where we have some uh, special guests uh, joining us today. Uh, from the Massage Therapist Association of Nova Scotia, President Amy Lynn Graves, Sandra Williams, Donna McCready, and Elizabeth uh, Pullen, from the Massage Therapists and Holistic Practitioners Association of the Maritimes, President Alicia Stacy, From the Natural Health Practitioners of Canada, Susan Alibi, Member uh, Representative for Atlantic Canada, and also staff from the Department of Health and Wellness, Cindy Cruikshank and Sarah Savage, and from the Department of Justice, Jennifer Morn. I'd ask each of those individuals to please rise and receive the warm welcome of the House.
The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Protect the Titles of Massage Therapists. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Protect the Titles of Massage Therapists. Bill number 193, entitled an act to, res to protect the titles of massage therapists. Ordered that this bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled an act to provide transparency to health authority expenditures. The Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Provide Transparency to Health Authority Expenditures. Bill number 194 entitled An Act to Provide Transparency to Health Authority Expenditures. Ordered that this bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to introduce a bill an Act to amend Chapter 122 of the Acts of 1924, an Act respecting the union of certain churches therein named. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 122 of the Acts of 1924, an Act respecting the union of certain churches therein named. Bill number 195, entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 122 of the Acts of 1924, an act respecting the union of certain churches therein named. Ordered that this bill be read a second time on a future day. <clears throat> the Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Ensure the Permanent Closure of the Sackville Landfill. <clears throat> The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Ensure the Permanent Closure of the Sackville Landfill. Bill number 196, entitled An Act to Ensure the Permanent Closure of the Sackville Landfill. Ordered that this bill be read a second time on a future day. We'll now move on to notices of motion. Statements by members. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today is the International Day of the Girl. This is a day of observance established by the United Nations in 2012. Mr. Speaker, we must acknowledge that there is worldwide gender inequality in areas such as legal rights, forced child marriage, violence against women, medical care, and access to education. Mr. Speaker, we must continue to raise awareness of issues facing girls at home and internationally. Today, I reflect upon my daughters and the world I hope for them, free of discrimination and gender inequality. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Mr. Speaker, on the International Day of the Girl, I would like to acknowledge the work of our colleagues in the Federal New Democratic Party. The slate of candidates running as New Democrats in this election is the most diverse of any party. 49% are women. 24% are racialized, 12% identify as LGBTQ+. 8% are Indigenous, 12% are youth, 5% are living with disabilities. Mr. Speaker, girls across the country can look to the candidates that we have put forward as inspirations for their own bright futures. In an interview, Manitoba NDP MLA Nani Fontaine called the legislature a profoundly white male space. Our caucus is committed to changing that situation which has been accepted for far too long. Mr. Speaker, along with our colleagues in this House, we are holding space for all girls. We're fighting for all girls, and we look forward to the day when they take their seats beside us. The Honourable Member for Clayton Park West. Mr. Speaker, uh, I beg leave to make an introduction. Permission we granted. We have with us in the East Gallery the most delightful, inspiring young girl. Uh, her name is... Um, 
Riley Cogswell, and we have with her her mother Erin and uh, her father Andrew, and I'm told it is Glenn and Beth, her grandparents as well. Please give them a, a big welcome while I read their. <laughs> member for Clayton Park West. Mr. Speaker, on International Day of the Girl, I would like to recognize Riley Cogswell, a wonderful grade six student at Park West School. I first had the pleasure of meeting Riley at a school litter cleanup last spring, where she and her friends demonstrated their passion for the environment. Riley is a member of the green team at her school, where she and her fellow peers clean garbage on, on school grounds every day and meet once a week to discuss their progress and vote on the volunteer of the week. Riley also volunteered at our litter patrol, um, uh, sorry, as a litter patrol at our annual barbecue this July, where she encouraged people to sort garbage and gave short speech on how everyone can help clean, uh, can help make an impact towards the great cause in our community. At the end of the barbecue, there was not one piece of garbage. It was all thanks to Riley. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank Riley for her outstanding work and volunteerism at a such young age. I'm truly inspired by her and her passion to make our community better. She has so many wonderful ideas, and I know she will go far in her life. I am thrilled to have an opportunity to work with her on our Litter Prevention Committee. She's our youngest member. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Colchester, Muscadabin Valley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it may take a while, but some people have found a way to con combine doing something they love with a successful career. I speak in particular of Rob Scott, a Greenfield resident who, as a talented artist, found himself creating sports drawings of celebrities like Sidney Crosby, Michael Jordan, but was having production time and purchase fees eating up his profit. For a while, Scott made a living with unique landscaping art, but this was not where his heart lay. Refusing to give up on his passion, Scott has redefined his style, finally securing an arrangement that allows him to create sanctioned prints of NHL and MLB players without the huge expense of purchasing signatures. I'd like to wish Rob Scott the best in his new phase of his talented career. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Hans East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. From the first quickening that expectant mothers feel to let us know that our baby girls would soon be arriving in our lives. From that first time we held them in our arms and those tiny fingers grasped ours and our, our eyes met for the first time. From the first time our daughters nuzzled for mother's milk, that magical bond was there. We have God's most precious gift, and now it's our responsibility to prepare them for the world. Our female children, our girls, learn by example, and it's our duty to show them the way. They learn compassion, caring, and responsibility. They learn independence, and that hard work brings its own rewards. Even more, they learn that the world is waiting for them, and there is nothing they cannot accomplish. To be a mom, nurse, or teacher, or how about an astronaut, physicist, or the Premier of Nova Scotia? On this day, October 11th, 2019, there are no barriers. Let's all celebrate on this International Day of the Girl. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. On October 4th, 1967, something extraterrestrial cra crashed off Shag Harbour. The sight of a glowing orange sphere slipping beneath the surface of the shore without a sound leaving behind a strange orange foam hasn't been forgotten by the community. In honour of the Shag Harbour UFO incident, the Royal Canadian Mint has issued a glow-in-the-dark coin that captures that eerie scene from more than 50 years ago. The coin was 95% sold out on the day it was announced on October 1st. Luckily, there were still some available at this past weekend's Shag Harbour UFO festival, but the 4,000 coins have since sold out. I want to thank the Mint for recognizing this important event and congratulate everyone who was able to get their hands on what is sure to be a local collector's item. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, I rise this morning on the International Day of the Girl to reflect on what this means for us here in Canada. A very crucial part of that Canadian context is the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiry, which released its final report earlier this year. 
The report is titled Reclaiming Power and Place, and it highlights a path for families, survivors, and all Canadians as we find a way through a deadly combination of patriarchy and colonialism. It speaks about the right to culture and how attacks on Indigenous culture are the backdrop for violence that Indigenous women, girls, and 2SLGBTQIA people experience today. It, it speaks about the right to health and how colonial violence has impacted the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health of Indigenous people. It speaks about the right to security and the almost constant threat that Indigenous women, girls, and 2S LGBTQIA people live with. And it speaks about the right to justice and the crucial disconnections between Indigenous people and the justice system. Here in this House, we need to always be reflecting on how we act to protect these rights today and every day. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. Uh, Mr. Speaker, on this International Day of the Girl, I would like to recognize two very important girls in my life, Rafina Bridget McGuire and Isla Rose McGuire, both named after uh, my mother-in-law and my mom. They are my two baby girls. Rafina and Isla have helped me become a better person. They have opened my eyes to see the world through their eyes, and they have made me turn my gaze inward and work on my own flaws to become a better human being. I woke up this morning, as I do every morning, with Isla snuggled into me, saying that she likes to steal my warmth. And Rafina, not much of a snuggler, <clears throat> lays about two feet away from me and just puts her foot against my foot so that she knows that I'm there. Rena and I remind them every single day that the world is theirs and they can be whatever they want. I hope that we all do whatever we can to leave a better world for them especially in, at this moment in time when we have a global debate around climate change and we have such a turmoil, term, turmoil going on worldwide. Sorry. Mr. Speaker, I love my babies with all my heart and soul, and they are more important to me than anything I do here or anywhere else. One last thing. Isla turns three tomorrow, so I love you, baby girl, and you might just get your LOL doll. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I take special pride in the amazing youth that live in my constituency. Today, I am pleased to recognize Amelia Brown, a special young lady with an exceptionally large heart. For the past two years, Amelia has volunteered at Queen's Manor in Liverpool. She compassionately engages with the residents, joining them on their outings and participating with them in their activities. An accomplished musician, on many occasions she brings out her guitar and mandolin, filling the manor with music and the residents' faces with smiles. Amelia graduated from Liverpool Regional High School in June and is now studying recreation management at Dalhousie University. Mr. Speaker, I would like to applaud Amelia's love for her community and her commitment to the residents of Queen's Manor, and I wish her much success as she follows her dreams. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Mr. Speaker, on the International Day of the Girl, I would like to pay tribute to my girls, Anna Audrey McClellan and Molly Agnes McClellan. They are both eight years old, but Anna is older by one minute. Molly says her passion is dancing. Anna also loves to dance, and both of them are talented artists, voracious readers, and also excel at torturing their younger brother, Samuel. Not a day goes by that my work in this chamber is not informed by my love for them. Mr. Speaker, we are raising our girls to be independent, kind, funny, and generous. So far, so good. The Honourable Member for Lunenburg. Mr. Speaker, this government <laughs> takes the issue of sexual harassment very seriously. In partnership with the Nova Scotia, Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission, we developed a free online tool to prevent and address sexual harassment in the workplace. The Safe Spaces Make Great Workplaces course will make sure people facing sexual harassment at work know who to contact and how to address the issue. Our government is committed to making sure everybody feels safe and respected at work. We believe that sexual harassment is totally unacceptable and has no place in our province. It is my hope that my granddaughters will never have to face sexual harassment in the workplace. Mr. Speaker, I would invite all of my fellow members to applaud the work that we are doing on this important file. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Pictou Centre. 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, Daryl Rushton, a retired Sobeys executive, businessman and entrepreneur from the Glasgow, is a great example of someone who experienced a very successful career. Rushton's standards and values were high. He realized a successful career takes time, commitment, and patience. His successful venture creating several apartment buildings in the Glasgow is an example of his unique entrepreneurial skills. He ensured that all of his buildings were peaceful, quiet, safe, as well as hazard-free. Individuals renting one of his properties held Mr. Rushton in high esteem. They, would, they often would say that their landlord always had an open line of communication with his tenants, provided prompt property maintenance, and maintained meticulous properties. His track record as a role model for this type of business is definitely one to observe and emulate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kings South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, local radio provides an invaluable public service for our communities. They entertain, inform, educate, and increase public dialogue on important issues. The staff at 89.3 K Rock in New Minas go even further by supporting the local community th through many generous charitable activities. The 11th annual 89.3 K Rock food drive took place from September 16th to 21st. In, in total, $24,680 and 7,600 pounds of non-perishable food was collected. Over the past 11 years, local community businesses and residents have donated over $100,000 and 140 pounds of food to this worthwhile cause. I invite all members of the Nova Scotia House of Assembly to join me in congratulating Mel Sampson, Darren Harvey, and their colleagues at K-Rock for their community spirit, enthusiastic energy, and ongoing support of Annapolis Valley families. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour Eastern Passage. Mr. Speaker, today we celebrate International Day of the Girl Child, a day recognized by the United Nations to highlight and address the needs and challenges faced by girls while promoting their empowerment and the fulfillment of their human rights. In Nova Scotia, girls are reaching great heights in science, academics, and so much more. Nova Scotian girls are setting a high standard. It's important to remember that while girls here achieve greatness, girls in other parts of the world continue to fight for basic human rights. Mr. Speaker, I want to give a special virtual hug to my three granddaughters, Michaela Ainsley and Aurora Adams, and my daughters-in-laws, Tina and Colleen and Andrea Adams, Janika Lavoie and Elise Sanderson, my two special aunts, Barbara McKenzie and Shirley Hutchinson, who were my uh, leaders when I was a child, and a special uh, thank you to my sister, Marilyn Bootlier, who has been taking wonderful care of my wonderful mother, who is 90 years old, but she's still a young girl at heart. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, on this International Day of the Girl, I would like to celebrate the work of two young leaders in climate action here in Jabuktuk, Julia Sampson and Willa Fisher. These young activists are students at Citadel High School and are two of the organizers of the local strikes and actions to bring attention to the need for climate action. And they have been inspired by another young, uh, amazing young woman, Greta Thunberg. I first encountered Julia's amazing voice and leadership at last spring's climate strike, and at that time I was inspired by her ability to galvanize her peers and take to the streets and call out politicians politicians of all levels on uh, their inaction. Since that first strike, Julia, Willa and several other young people have continued to lead actions, most recently of course, the week of climate action that culminated in 10,000 people taking to the streets to call for immediate steps to limit our Earth's warming to 1.5 degrees. They are, the work that they are doing is working. People are paying attention and demanding more from their politicians. Mr. Speaker, as the mother of a much younger activist, I'm grateful that my daughter has people like Julia and Willa to look up to. They are showing her that she can use her strong voice to express her fears, her hopes and dreams, and her demands that people that hold power listen to her. The Honourable Member for Bedford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On this International Day of the Girl, I'd like to congratulate Madeline Harper on receiving the 2019 Bedford Youth Volunteer of the Year Award. Madeline is one of the longest serving and most dedicated youth volunteers in Bedford District Girl Guides. She began volunteering in a Spark unit when she was only in fourth grade. She moved on more recently to assist with the Brownie unit, helping to plan and run meetings and sharing her wealth of knowledge to new guiders. 
Madeline is also active in Girl Guides at the district level, where she helps at meetings, events, and camps. She has served as a patrol leader at the provincial camp for a group of guides age 9 to 11. She's a grade 11 honor student at CP Allen High School, where she's an accomplished singer and lends her talents to the school choir and musical. She's a member of the Halifax Regional Arts Bedford Voices Choir, as well as being one of the youngest members of the Nova Scotia International Tattoo Adult Choir. Madeline is also a member of the Bedford Be Beavers swim team and is also a swim official. She volunteered for the Atrium Youth Leadership Program as a junior leader for several summers. She's a deeply impressive young woman, and I want to thank her for all her efforts and congratulate her on being named Bedford's Youth Volunteer of the Year for 2019. The Honourable thank Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, many locals and others throughout the province remember what the opening of Ski Cape Smoky and Ingen initiated in the 1970s. Businesses were moving, people were coming to the area, and school children had the opportunity to learn to ski. Over the almost 50 years since then, the hill has faced many challenges and threatened closures. But thanks to Councillor Larry Duffany, his tremendous volunteers, and many others before them, the hill remained open in the hopes that someday someone would take it over. This year, their wish came true as the province sold the property to Cape Smoky Holdings, led by Pre President Joseph Ballas. Mr. Speaker, I ask all members to join me in wishing Cape Smoky Holdings all the best as they further enhance the facilities and offerings in beautiful English. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Claire Digby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to today, today to congratulate Meadow Carmen of Barton, the Canadian Sports School Hockey League's Female Humanitarian of the Year. Meadow, who currently attends the Pursuit of Excellence Hockey at Academy in Kelowna, is a remarkable young woman and an accomplished hockey player and student. Raised by parents stressing the importance of having an impact on her community, she has volunteered as a camp counselor with the 4-H, the Me to We, and recently she traveled to Mexico with her school to help families build homes. Meadow also tries to initiate change around her and when she, as when she was encouraged by her academy classmates to join a basketball team for kids from a nearby school. She hoped this would start bridging the divide between students from the two schools. One man she crossed paths with in an airport may claim that she has had the biggest impact on his life. When both were rushing to catch a flight, he collapsed next to her. Meadow immediately started compressions until help arrived. Meadow is always approached every day with a positive attitude, but this incident has given this young woman a greater appreciation of life. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sackville Cobbequid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize Mr. John Giannakis, owner and operator of Hellas Family Restaurant on Sackville Drive in Lower Sackville. Numerous residents in Sackville, Beaverbank, and Lucasville felt the effects of Hurricane Dorian, which made landfall on Saturday, September 7th. And as a result, they lost power to their homes and businesses. On Sunday, the following day, John Giannakis graciously opened Hella's Family Restaurant and invited the community to come to his restaurant to enjoy a warm meal. Mr. Speaker, I would like to ask all members of the Nova Scotia House of Assembly to join me and take this opportunity to thank Mr. John Giannakis for his kindness and caring in providing the residents of these communities a complimentary meal at his restaurant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Waverly Fall River Beaver Bank. Mr. Speaker, today, October the 11th, is the United Nations International Day of the Girl Child with the, nine, uh, with the 2019 theme, Girl Force. Unscripted and unstoppable to increase awareness of gender equality faced by girls worldwide. Mr. Speaker, many girls living in predominantly marginalized communities across Nova Scotia will still experience racism and exclusion, struggle academically and leave school with less than their needs to succeed. Our government is committed to ensuring all girls and young women be given equal opportunities and supports needed to, for they can grow up in the best that they can be. I ask all members of the House of Assembly join me in recognizing October the 11th, 2019 as an International Day of the Girl Child and stand up for the human rights of girls living across our province 
Canada and the world. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to acknowledge how Council 13987 of the Knights of Columbus at the St. Thomas More Church stepped up during a time of need. One of their members, Brother Dan McDonald, suffered a terrible setback. When their family's calls for assistance were left unanswered, the Knights of Columbus decided to immediately send contributions and assist in building a new wheelchair ramp for Mr. McDonald's house. The Knights of Columbus Council promptly found a contractor and oversaw operations until completion. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Knights of Columbus at St. Thomas More Church for their remarkable work and thank all those who volunteer their time to helping fellow Nova Scotians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today on International Day of the Girl, I would uh, like to recognize the, the group of volunteers and coordinators, including uh, Ms. Holly LaPierre, who hosted the under-16 uh, national championships for baseball this, this summer. Uh, the, the championships were played in Bedford and Sackville. Um, I had the opportunity to do some volunteering and see the girls play and uh, enjoy some company of their fans. And it was, it was really just a great, uh, great event for Nova Scotia and a great event for, for all the girls who had the opportunity to participate. So uh, given today's... Uh, uh, significance. I think that it's appropriate that uh, we recognize not only athletic opportunities that are provided to young girls, uh, but all opportunities should continue to build and uh, continue to um, evolve so that every opportunity can be afforded to uh, the next generation of our, our women. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to acknowledge Anne Marie Lewis, a parent and teacher at Blue Cap Elementary School in Canning. Emory had the vision of an outdoor classroom, a space that would give children opportunities to forge stronger connections to our natural environment. On September 27th, I was pleased to attend the grand opening of the ceremony of the Glooscap Elementary Outdoor Classroom. The outdoor classroom has a large timber frame shade structure with benches, paths, stumps, and tire mounds, and many trees, shrubs, and plants. There are plans to add to these features. Many parents, students, teachers, and community members and groups were involved in creating this space. Each class has adopted a tree they will be responsible for taking care of over the years. This outdoor classroom was a fantastic idea and valuable addition to one of our local schools and communities. I applaud Lewis for her time and commitment to raising awareness about the need to protect our environment and giving our local children tangible ways to learn how to make this by making the, her vision a reality. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Chester St. Margaret's. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, during Fire Prevention Week, I want to recognize and thank all the dedicated full-time and volunteer firefighters, including my son Kevin and my nephew Neil, who provide tireless support to our communities. In the constituency of Chester St. Margaret's, we are fortunate to have eight dedicated fire stations. We all know that firefighting is critically important, but I think we can all agree that fire prevention is better. Personally, I was pleased to join the United Volunteer Fire Departments of the Municipality of Chester last weekend at a very successful fire prevention exhibit. Our firefighters save lives through public education as well as their bravery during emergencies. Mr. Speaker, during this Fire Prevention Week, I invite the members of the House of Assembly to join me in recognizing and thanking all the men and women serving in our fire stations to keep us safe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to rise today to acknowledge Landon White, a 14-year-old constituent of Cumberland South from Joggins. On August 18th, Landon won the Briggs Junior Light Canadian Kart Racing Championship at Canadian Tire Motorsport Park in Bon Bonemanville, Ontario. Landon is very new to this sport as he has only been racing for about three months and competed against other racers that have been racing for several years all over North America. Please join me in congratulating Landon for his national championship success and wish him continued success in the future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rode my bicycle downtown this morning, uh, in fact, for the first time this session and for the first time in a long time. So it was my first experience of the new shared pathway along Barrington Street, which in fact extends um, all the way to downtown and a slightly awkward exit near the Hollis Street bike lane. 
And this morning, nobody was parked in the Hollow Street bike lane, so I had a smooth ride to the office, which I enjoyed very much. I want to appreciate the municipal politicians, planners, engineers, and workers who contributed to this expansion of uh, good cycling infrastructure um, between my constituency and downtown. And I especially want to acknowledge that for this project to happen, community members, uh, activists, volunteers with the Halifax Cycling, uh, Halifax Cycling Coalition and individuals had to push. And as evidence mounts that we need more change more quickly to dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions emitted through transportation, I hope we can all join with our constituents to push. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sydney Whitney Pier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, on this International Day of the Girl, uh, I just want to bring uh, to the attention of the host an incredible story that took uh, that's taking place in Sydney. Uh, grade 12 student Bell Jacobs uh, tried out for the Sydney Academy uh, boys hockey team, uh, and she made the roster. So for the first time, in the first time in the, over the 100 year, 100 year history of the Sydney Academy hockey team, a female will play on the team. It is also the first time in the history of the Cape Breton High School Hockey League uh, that, that, a, that, a, that a girl will play. So on behalf of all of us in the legislature, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to congratulate Belle on her amazing accomplishment uh, in, in being the first female to play hockey in, high school, uh, in the high school league in Cape Breton. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, today is International Day of the Girl Child. In 1995, at the Fourth World Conference on Women, the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action was adopted. This declaration is an inspiring platform for the world over, including Canada. One such goal included in the declaration is the empowerment and advancement of women, including the right to freedom of thought, conscious, religion and belief, thus contributing to the moral, ethical, spiritual and intellectual needs of women and men, individually or in community with others, and thereby guaranteeing them the possibility of realizing their fullest potential in society and shaping their lives in accordance with their own aspirations. Mr. Speaker, we, may we each strive to empower the advancement of girls and women in our own families, in our own communities, province and country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, today is International Day of the Girl, and it is especially incumbent upon us to be mindful that girls will one day grow up to be women, with either a healthy sense of self or, unfortunately, some with a broken spirit because of influences and pressures unique to girls. Mr. Speaker, I rise today so as to acknowledge the strength and power that a young girl can be provided with by offering guidance through effective role modelling, providing opportunities to build leadership skills, and through nurturing positive relationships and experiences. And with one other thing, Mr. Speaker, that I'm hoped that we are all blessed with, which is something very basic, and that's love. Mr. Speaker, it is imperative that we are all positive role models by leading by example for our young girls, showing them that it is okay to stand up for what you believe in, to be true to yourself, and to lead with compassion and conviction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Guysboro Eastern Shore, Trackety. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in recognition of a former long-term resident of Guysboro County, Gloria Ann Wesley. <clears throat> Gloria is an educator, author, and community leader who recently received an honorary degree from Mount St. Vincent University. A well-loved teacher in the former Strait Regional School Board, Gloria spent years educating youth and developing the leaders of the future and working in student services focused on social studies and race relations. In 1975, Gloria became the first published African Nova Scotia poet when she released To My Someday Child. She has won and been nominated for many awards for her works and her novel, Chasing Freedom, is listed by the Department of Education as a grade nine and African Nova Scotian studies resource. Throughout her life, Gloria worked in African Nova Scotia communities to create employment opportunities and develop programs and youth clubs such as the Upper Big Trackety Crusaders. She has also served on the board of the Black Cultural Center of Nova Scotia, the Black Loyalist Society, and the Black Educators Association. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to applaud Gloria for her years as an educator, commitment to community, talented writing, and dedicated to share African Nova Scotia history. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
The Honourable Member for Pictou Centre. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Town of Stellarton has announced the hiring of a new Chief of Police Services. The Town is pleased to have a veteran police officer taking over the reins of enforcement in their area. Mark Hoback, a former member of the Halifax Regional Police with 31 years of service, has begun his new duties as of September the 30th. Hoback has been the recipient of numerous awards during his career, formally recognized for years of dedicated involvement through departmental awards and commendations. The Stuttering Police Service provides 24-7 police service to more than 4,200 residents. The force consists of 10 officers in addition to term officers and dispatch for 17 fire departments across Pictou County. The community is delighted to have an experienced officer joining, joining the Sellerton Police Force. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Armdale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to pay tribute to former Nova Scotia Premier and Senator John Buchanan. I recall first meeting Senator Buchanan in 1985 when I was a page in this House of Assembly and he was the Premier. Since that time, I've had the opportunity to speak with him at many community events and most recently at Christmas celebrations at Melville Heights in Armdale. He always reminded me that we both had so much in common. We both come and have large families. Uh, we both are lawyers and like to find ways to resolve disputes and promote justice. But he always had to remind me that the one thing we didn't share was our political perspectives. Today, we as a community will gather to celebrate his life and extend our condolences to his wife, Mavis, five children, and an entire community. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to bring recognition to Coal Harbour musician Guy Paul Thibault. Guy has a new album out called The Road Between. It was released on March 1, 2019. Ian Luer of Eastern Passage, Nova Scotia, was grateful for the opportunity to play bass for one of the new album songs. The album's genre touches on a bit of folk, classic rock, and lots in between. It has been 17 years since Guy Paul has produced a solo album, so we were very excited. I ask all members of the Nova Scotia Legislature to join me in recognizing Guy Paul Dubow for his new album and Ian Luer for being a part of it. We wish all of them success in the future as they deserve this as their new album and future musical endeavors take off. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Hans West. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today, being International Day of the Girl, to recognize uh, five uh, ladies in my life who have a direct impact daily one of whom I've been married to for more years than I can remember, who does her best to keep me on track. Uh, four others' daughters, uh, as many of you may know, who also do their best to keep me on track and support me, Mr. Speaker. And I wish them the very best in the years ahead and all the young ladies. And not just today, Mr. Speaker, it being International Day of the Girl, and in my house, Mr. Speaker, it is Day of the Girl, 365 a year. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Mr. Speaker, a lot of married couples might start hobbies, just new hobbies, just to get out of the house. Hank and Rosa Neeston, the former owners of Hank's Family Farm in Millville, go to the racetrack, not to watch, but to race their cars. This couple, Hank at 80, and Rosa at 79, travels across Atlantic Canada to participate, with each having their own car and are no strangers to the winner's circle. When asked when they plan to retire, they both laugh and agree that it won't be happening anytime soon. Mr. Speaker, I ask all members of the legislature to join me in congratulating Rosa and Hank on their success and wish them well as they keep the pedal to the metal. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to oral questions put by members to ministers. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to ask a question to the uh, Premier. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to begin by revisiting for the third consecutive Friday. This government's decision to voluntarily assume liability for the South Park crane. Now, we asked on September 27th and October 4th, I'll table that, uh, what the cost might be in case something goes wrong with the crane removal. We know 11 buildings are at risk because residents of those 11 buildings have to leave this Thanksgiving weekend. An unfortunate time for them. My question for the Premier or any of the four ministers involved, why can't the government provide a cost for the potential liability arising from this crane cleanup? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, as he would know, the complexity of this uh, site, uh, the crane was owned by an operator, Mr. Speaker, that was leased to, to a developer. 
the crane collapsed on another developer's property. We have a number of existing buildings around it. Uh, it became pretty clear uh, that this had been something that the crane operator or the engineering firms had not dealt with before. The, so uh, all of them were very nervous about being on that site. We wanted to make sure that that crane came down as quickly as possible for public safety. Uh, there's a number of steps that we've we've taken. Uh, one is we had to uh, do an ultrasound of the building prior to any work happening. Uh, the work is ongoing. The building, uh, the crane is now strapped to that building. Uh, the, it's my understanding it'll start coming down this weekend, weather permit uh, permitting, and then we'll do another ultrasound to ensure that uh, uh, any damage that had happened didn't happen during the removal of the crane. Uh, and then we will go after insurance companies, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that we recoup uh, the money that was required. <coughs> The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's good to at least hear that the government may go after the insurance companies uh, for that money because I think everyone agrees on safety, but the people who may have to pay for it, which could be the taxpayer, if something goes wrong, deserve an estimate of the cost. And the questions that come to my mind is why is the government afraid to share that information? Why the fear of, sh of being transparent? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think it looks weak. And I think it doesn't build trust for Nova Scotians when their governments are faced with these situations. Another example, Mr. Speaker, is the ferry and an update on the 2019 season. Uh, the minister's response on October 1st was that we're going to have a statement on what the season looks like next week. Well, we're at the end of that week, it's, and there's no statement. So the question, why has the Minister of Transportation not delivered the statement he has promised? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm not sure uh, where the Honourable Member is going with the question. The reality of it is, Mr. Speaker, this became about public safety when it came to the crane. Uh, we continue uh, to make sure that we bring down the, that facility in a safe manner for the people who are on that site and those that are surrounding it. There's been constant communication, Mr. Speaker, to make sure uh, that that uh, crane comes down. It became the responsibility of the government, uh, Mr. Speaker, to ensure public safety. Uh, that's what we will do uh, because of the good fiscal management, Mr. Speaker. We will be able to manage this file. Uh, and I want to remind the Honourable Member, we continue to make that investment in the Yarmouth Ferry. We continue to do, uh, and we'll continue to make that because we believe in that ferry service and we know the impact when it's not running, Mr. Speaker, and the Honourable Member should know uh, that as we continue, as, as his party continues to undermine that service, Mr. Speaker, they're undermining small businesses across this province. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, it's a great joy for me to be going door to door in the federal campaign talking to people about the NDP platform and what it could mean <coughs> for our province. Take housing. We know thousands of people are unable to stay in the places where they live. Thousands more are being pushed out of their neighborhoods by the escalating uh, process that's happening with house prices, uh, but the NDP's federal platform calls for 500,000 units of affordable housing to be built. Uh, that'll be 13,000 new units on the market here in Nova Scotia. Uh, so I want to ask the Premier, do, does he agree with me that 13,000 new affordable housing units would be a wonderful thing for us here in Nova Scotia? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank uh, the Honourable for the question. Uh, he would know prior to the federal election campaign, the Minister uh, responsible for housing, signed an agreement with the national government of over $400 million to make those investments in affordable housing across our province. Uh, we're going to continue to work uh, with communities uh, we've seen that are impacted. Uh, he's sitting on an issue that is very important, uh, Mr. Speaker, with the growth that has happened uh, in this city. Uh, it has put pressure on affordable housing rents, why we brought in rent subs. And we know there's more work to do, uh, Mr. Speaker, in collaboration with the, with the city. Uh, we'll continue to provide options to ensure that we have affordable housing. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, all across our province, there are uh, many, many homes where there are empty medication containers sitting on dressers and in the middle of kitchen tables and on the counter because people are waiting until they can afford to fill their prescriptions. And we know this is very negative for the health care system because people who don't uh, fulfill their prescriptions are much more likely to end up in the hospital. The NDP's federal plan uh, is not for a study or a commission or a pilot project. It's to bring in universal pharmacare by the end of 2020. Does the Premier agree with me that we would be in a much better position in the health care crisis if in 15 months from now we would have universal pharmacare in Nova Scotia? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we have uh, supported a national pharmacare program, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, from the very beginning. We believe that would be a positive step. 
Uh, the detail, Mr. Speaker, in uh, the plan that the honourable member talking about is important, just as it is with all national pharma care plans being presented by federal parties. Uh, the details surrounding the implementation of that is important. Uh, but we have clearly said, as a government and as a province, we're more than willing to participate and look at what a national pharma care looks like in, no in Canada. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, the highest sell and in internet prices in all Canada, of all provinces, are paid here by our people in Nova Scotia. We pay uh, the most uh, for uh, coverage that is subpar uh, outside of the cities. The federal NDP's plan is to bring in a price cap on cell phones to see that cell phone prices can't exceed the global average. Does the Premier agree with me that people in Nova Scotia would have uh, money to spend on an awful lot of other things if we weren't being nailed so badly on cell phone and internet charges? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, uh, I want to thank the for the question. He's highlighting an important uh, message. Uh, I, I think, uh, Mr. Speaker, the, the concept needs to be carefully thought out. Uh, he is absolutely right. In some parts of our province and in our country, uh, large cities have great access to the internet and great access to cell phone coverage. Uh, this requires a tremendous amount of capital, Mr. Speaker, in other parts of our province and the country to make those investments. Continuing to cap, Mr. Speaker, prevents that growth and investment in other parts. So what, what's missing from that is who's going to pay the difference? Who's going to pay that and how much public money is required to make that happen? That's why we've continued over this period of time to set aside $200 million to inspect internet and cell phone service. That's why the Minister of Municipal Services continue to work the 9 fund to make sure, can we use that to make sure we provide cellular service? But there's an important piece missing, Mr. Speaker, when people just talk about cost, who's paying the bill at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Question for the Minister of Health. Yesterday we asked a question about the 811 report health officials referred to at this week's Health Committee meeting on that very topic. We've looked for the report, Mr. Speaker. We've checked the government website, Department of Health and Wellness website, the Health Authority website, press releases, Twitter feeds. Mr. Speaker, why does the Minister allow his officials to discuss the report but not reveal it? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the report uh, has been made available, uh, Mr. Speaker, when it was requested. Uh, this was a report that was uh, brought together. We were looking to uh, assess the work as part of our ongoing operations, Mr. Speaker. I think this is what Nova Scotians would expect us to do, is uh, when we have a system that's up and running, we look for opportunities to continuously improve the system. One of the important steps in that is to assess it. We've done that work, Mr. Speaker. We've taken uh, information from that. We continue uh, to pursue these opportunities. When uh, mm -hmm. asked uh, for the information, Mr. Speaker, we uh, made it available. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, I don't know who, who he made it available to because it's nowhere on the government's communications. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this was a Liberal topic they put before the Health Committee. As officials spoke like the report was complete, but as this self-proclaimed most transparent government in the history of the province, uh, they didn't dare release the report in advance of the committee meeting because they were afraid it might generate questions. So, Mr. Speaker, you know, we've seen the Premier, I'm just going to table these, we've seen him say and brag about his transparency many times. Mr. Speaker, the Premier and his cabinet can do better. They can make the best information available before a committee meets of the legislature, Mr. Speaker. My question, why won't the minister table the 811 report here in the legislature? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I believe uh, there have been requests uh, for uh, the report. It was made available to the media, uh, Mr. Speaker. It was, uh, they, they, uh, they, they, I mean, uh, my, actually, Mr. Order, please. The Honourable Minister of Health has the floor. And Mr. Speaker, uh, I saw a, a note uh, come across my desk. It's my understanding it's made available to the NDP caucus that they've uh, requested the report, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so uh, the information is uh, there and, uh, and available, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so again, there's uh, absolutely nothing that we've been uh, hiding. I don't have a copy of the report with me uh, to table, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister responsible for housing. 
As he would be aware, people in this province are facing an unprecedented housing crunch. And it's not just here in Halifax. We're actually hearing from businesses on the South Shore that can't fill positions, not because they can't find workers, but because the workers can't find a place to live. In the federal riding of South Shore St. Margaret, 17% of households spend more than 50% of their income on rent and utilities. That's 1,200 families. There simply isn't a enough affordable housing in this province. Mr. Speaker, will the minister please table how many new housing units will result from the three-year action plan under the bilateral housing agreement? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Nova Scotia. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for that question, an important question it is. Um, we know right across this province, it certainly is not just in any one location, it's throughout all municipal areas. Affordable housing has been a discussion for some years, Mr. Speaker, that's why we are pleased to have signed a couple of months back the National Housing Agreement. This will invest many hundreds of millions of dollars in this province, Mr. Speaker, whereby we will work with our partners, whether they be nonprofits, co-ops, Mr. Speaker, or the private sector sector to further develop the affordable housing market. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, I did not hear the Minister reference a number of new units that will be created. When questioned about the housing crisis in this province, the government constantly references either rent supplements, which don't work in, an, in a low vacancy environment, or the bilateral housing agreement. And it is good news that the agreement has finally been signed. But the fact is that the first three years of the plan will result in very few new affordable housing units. The bulk of the money will go to repairs and renovations. And while we certainly need to fix existing affordable housing units, I'm left to wonder why this situation has been left for so long that there are three years and tens of millions of dollars of repairs left that we need to do. Will, Mr. Speaker, will the minister please table how many social housing units are currently vacant because they're not fit to live in? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Nova Scotia. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As I said, we will continue to work with our partners right across this province to develop. Mr. Speaker, we will be going out with an open and transparent uh, process in the coming weeks around how we will uh, invest with partners right across this province, whether they be the private sector, whether they be not-for-profits, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to do that. We know that there's much work to be done. The first three years will invest heavily in the current stock that we have, Mr. Speaker, which will allow, Mr. Speaker, 17,000 Nova Scotians who um, have a place to call home today to continue to have that place to call home, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Wellness. Um, earlier this week, I spoke to a desperate mother from Barrington in my constituency who fears for the life of her seven-year-old son. She also forwarded to me a letter detailing her son's story, which I will table. Kayla Atkinson's son, Olson, is autistic. Olson's sensory issues and his inability to focus limits him to eating only a few bites each meal. At seven years old, Olson only weighs 38 pounds, Mr. Speaker. The Atkinson family has been referred by Yarmouth's lone pediatrician to the IWK, and the IWK has provided a six to 12 month wait to be seen. Olson has waited six months so far. What advice does the minister have for family, families like Olson's? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, first and, and foremost, uh, we recognize uh, the importance of uh, being there and providing supports for uh, families uh, and individual Nova Scotians uh, with autism spectrum disorder, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that's why we uh, continue to make investments and expand uh, new programs. Uh, for example, Mr. Speaker, we've uh, expanded the program or created a new program uh, for um, intensive uh, brief uh, intervention uh, for complex cases, Mr. Speaker, made that announcement earlier this year along with the investments uh, to learn from that program uh, as well as the Quick Start program, Mr. Speaker, to complement the EIBI program. Uh, specifically, though, Mr. Speaker, uh, when the member, as we uh, spoke uh, yesterday, was the first time brought uh, the, the, the context uh, of this uh, to my attention, is provide me the details. I'll uh, investigate, certainly, uh, with the clinicians, but we do have to work with the clinicians any time that there's a, a, a clinical uh, need there, Mr. Speaker, and that work uh, will certainly help uh, clarify. The Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his commitment to working on this file. 
Uh, Kayla Atkinson says Olson is wasting away before her eyes, but she also feels betrayed by a system and a government that boasts of spending and programming for development disorders, but has left her boy behind. Kayla's greatest fear is that her child will simply give up. I'm sure that, Ols the Olsons, or that Olson's family isn't the only one in the province experiencing struggles accessing services at the IWK. Therefore, what will the minister do to improve access to services at the IWK for families like Olson's? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we continue uh, to work uh, collaboratively uh, with uh, uh, experts uh, working in the field with uh, autism spectrum disorder. Uh, it's been through these engagements that uh, our priority investments uh, that we've been making into new programs, like the uh, BIOS program intervention for complex cases to help support uh, individuals uh, with autism spectrum disorder and their loved ones uh, in their community, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, where they, they are uh, to, uh, to provide that support. It's why we expanded, created a new program called Quick Start, uh, which allows us to uh, complement the EIBI program it addresses not just individuals with autism spectrum disorder, uh, they don't have to wait uh, to be diagnosed specifically with that condition, um, but others are available. So we are taking steps, we're taking the advice of uh, frontline uh, experts in this area and we're putting the money behind those programs. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Question for the Minister of Health. Eleven doctors have left the regional hospital in Antigonish in a little over a year. That affects people in the surrounding counties. Something is wrong. The Minister of Health must accept at least some responsibility for this. The last obstetrician for expectant moms left in the summer. People in the region are now left with only a visiting obstetrician. Mr. Speaker, Antigonish should be more than just a place to visit. It is a great place to live, and the hospital should be a great place to work if this minister were providing the support to ensure that. Does the minister realize that the remaining physicians carrying the load from these departures, departures are now feeling the strain from this mismanagement. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, unlike uh, the member opposite, uh, Mr. Speaker, I believe St. Martha's a Hospital continues to be a great place to work, uh, Mr. Speaker. And if he, if he would engage, Mr. Speaker, uh, with uh, people, they, they recognize that, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in fact, I received an email uh, earlier this week, I don't have a copy with me, from an obstetrician, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, who's expressed interest uh, in coming to uh, uh, situate herself. She's been one of those physicians providing the locum coverage, and she recently emailed me to say that she's actually looking at making a permanent uh, position in Anakinish, Mr. Speaker. So while the member opposite may criticize or think that there's something wrong with having people providing locum services, in fact, one of the reasons pr uh, professionals, uh, physicians use locum services is actually to establish where they may want to practice. And again, Mr. Speaker, we're seeing people uh, wanting to practice in Anakinish and follow up with that. And two days they continue to receive full coverage at the site day to day. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Mr. Speaker, that's good news. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, I would also say this. This is 11 physicians in just a little over a year. If it was one or two, absolutely. But 11 in a little over a year is significant. The Minister should be recognizing there's a problem. The more we bring in to replace those that leave, the question becomes for those, are they going to be happy and stay? You know, the obstetrician who left was also a gynecologist. Uh, women with incontinence, abnormal uterine bleeding, or abnormal pap smears, who had already waited months to be seen by the specialist in Antigonish, have now had to be referred elsewhere. They are waiting again. People can fall through the cracks when the load is heavy on the remaining doctors. And I know it's heavy, Mr. Speaker. That is not their fault. They're only working in the, su in the system that this government is providing them. Women may experience a delay in cancer diagnosis, and we know how important time is as a factor in beating cancer. Why isn't the minister protecting women who need these services in our region? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Of course, uh, we do recognize the importance of providing uh, health care services across the province, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we recognize that importance in our primary health care system, in our emergency and our acute uh, system, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that's why we continue to make investments. We make investments in our primary care uh, support services, Mr. Speaker, uh, like the $40 million investment uh, in uh, compensation around comprehensive uh, primary care, Mr. Speaker, and incentives to attach more Nova Scotians. Is it working? Yes, it is 
is, Mr. Speaker, there's 12% fewer people waiting for access to uh, primary care practice in Nova Scotia than there were this time last year. Mr. Speaker, we continue to add uh, specialist residency seats, Mr. Speaker, as well as family practice residency seats in Nova Scotia, the only province in the country to do that. So we're taking the steps, Mr. Speaker, necessary to address the long-standing uh, challenges within our health care sector. The Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, my, my question is also for the Minister of Health. Last session, I asked the Minister about closures at All Saints and Cumberland, South Cumberland. The Minister's answer was, as the member would know, when closures take place, it is a last resort. It is done when the NSHA is unable to fill shifts. I'll table that. He also went on to explain, that's why we have been listening to our frontline health care providers. We've been changing our incentive programs, compensation, because that is what their physicians are asking for. As of last week, the NSHA is still looking for physicians for all these hospitals, whether full-time, part-time, or local. My question to the minister is, will the, while the incentive program has been initiated, the problem persists. When can the people of Cumberland South expect reliable ER services? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, and the members uh, absolutely correct. Uh, the statement and the response that I uh, provided uh, earlier this year uh, continues to uh, stand. Uh, as the, the member would note, uh, the uh, compensation structure and, and framework uh, is part of a master agreement negotiated with uh, the bargaining agent on behalf of physicians across the province. Doctors Nova Scotia, those negoti negotiations are ongoing. I won't get into uh, details around that, uh, but Mr. Speaker, uh, we didn't wait uh, throughout uh, this term and office. Uh, for uh, uh, the, the full negotiations. We recognize that in some areas uh, we needed to enhance incentive programs. We took those steps, Mr. Speaker, to ensure continuity of services uh, to the best that we can. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, those efforts will continue. We'll continue to listen to frontline health care workers. We'll continue to make investments. We'll continue to strengthen health care in this province. The Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Mr. Speaker, the incentive program has been there, and there's still no re reassurance that the ERs are going to be open. As of this week, All Saints, for an example, was closed on Tuesday, will be closed all weekend and Wednesday. I still have residents that don't have access to primary health care, lack of clinics, lack of physicians. When will the minister stop lecturing the members on the opposition about his non-existent plan for ERs and physician coverage and explain what his plan is going to be for all Nova Scotians? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Again, uh, if, uh, the member would know that uh, all members of this legislature, indeed all Nova Scotians, recognize the importance of uh, their health care uh, and ensuring that the health care services and sports are there for them. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, it is a, a complex uh, system, including primary care, emergency and acute care, uh, specialty services. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we're taking steps in all of these areas to improve, not just in the short term, but the long term, Mr. Speaker. And one of the things that's important about that is the medium and the long term support Supports include the training of more professionals. Mr. Speaker, we've added additional seats to the Dalhousie Medical School program as well as the nurse practitioner program. We're the only jurisdiction to add to both family physician and specialist residency training seats, Mr. Speaker. Those are the things that are going to provide the, the sustainable health care in communities like his and all across this province. The Honourable Member for Pitco Centre. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Wellness. Mr. Speaker, numerous medical students are interested in family and emergency medicine. I'm aware of one particular doctor that graduated from a Canadian university, took his family residency, and applied last fall to Dalhousie Medical School to take the one-year specialty training in ER. This individual is from Nova Scotia, and he expressed a desire to return to Nova Scotia, but did not receive any response from our medical school. He eventually accepted one year of a specialty training in emergency medicine through the College of Family Physicians of Canada in another province. My question is the Minister, if two other schools accepted this individual's application, why would our medical school not acknowledge a Nova Scotian's application when we are in need of so many physicians? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, indeed, as I've uh, noted, uh, the importance of having the uh, training seats and spots available at Dalhousie uh, Medical School here in Nova Scotia is important. Uh, the vast majority of the medical seats that we have are uh, filled by Nova Scotia students. The additional uh, seats that we added, the four this year, the additional 12 next year, for a total of 16 new medical seats in the Dalhousie Medical School are targeted towards Nova Scotia students, Mr. Speaker, plus the additional residency seats, 10 family physicians, 
position, 15 specialists that we've added. These are all things that we recognize are important, uh, as the member highlighted. As far as the specific case that the members uh, raised, uh, I'm not familiar with the details or the circumstances. I'd have to follow up uh, with Dalhousie uh, Medical School uh, to inquire, and if the member has a privacy waiver from the individual involved, I'm sure I could have those conversations and get to the bottom of it. The Honourable Member for Pickerel Centre. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in this example, we have a medical specialist from Nova Scotia leaving his position in a major Canadian centre to return home to fill a two-year term position. This move was with the hope of being able to establish a career in his home province. Ironically, at the end of his term, he was told there was no position available that would allow him to stay in Nova Scotia. He was quickly accepted in another centre outside of this province and has since moved away. Question to the Minister, can the Minister please explain how a system that is in such need of medical professionals can frustrate two Nova Scotians to the point that they move away for employment, and does he agree it suggests a disconnect between the NSHA and his department? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, and, and I apologize. I didn't catch uh, if the member uh, referred to what exact uh, area of specialization that uh, was being referenced in that uh, specific case. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, um, I would assume in a situation where they were advised that there wasn't a position available, that it would be an area of specialization which the Nova Scotians have a full complement. Uh, that would likely be the reason there, Mr. Speaker. Uh, while we have much of our discussion here on the floor of this legislature and in the public uh, about a areas of uh, most uh, demand or need, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there are certain uh, specialties and areas that uh, are in high demand, not just in Nova Scotia, but across the, pro the, the country and indeed much of the Western world. Uh, but not all specialties are in uh, that level of need, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we need to spend our resources and focus on filling those vacancies that have the highest need. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Community Services. Since 2014, the department has spent more than $10 million on what it is called a transformation of the income assistance program. Based on a request made by our caucus, the department provided us with a, number, a table with the number of households receiving income assistance who would be considered to be in core housing need, spending more than 30% of their income on shelter once the new standard household rate comes into effect. Mr. Speaker, does the minister think it is appropriate that after this transformation, 16,150 households, more than half of the department's income assistance caseload, will still be struggling to afford housing? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. As the Honourable Member knows, uh, the standard household rate, once implemented, will no longer include a housing uh, component, uh, which is, I re recognize is not uh, uh, responsive to a particular question. But in this particular case, Mr. Speaker, what we do know is that more people will be moving out of core housing need, Mr. Speaker, because of the investments we were making in standard household rate, which, as I've explained to the, the uh, Honourable Member before, is more than three times the amount spent annually, the increase will be more than three times any increase that has ever been given in, in, um, our, to, to our clients in terms of uh, community services. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, the Income Assistance Program supports 29,000 households in Nova Scotia. And like all of us, these families are thinking about the cold months to come and the rising costs of keeping the heat and the lights on. Energy poverty is defined as spending more than 10% of your income on household energy. After five years of consultants' fees and pilot projects, the transformation unveiled by the Department of Community Services leaves 3,080 households in energy poverty. Mr. Speaker, is the minister satisfied that the standard household rate set by her government leaves so many Nova Scotians out in the cold? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the Honourable Member would know, we are expanding our efficiency uh, programs to increase the uh, energy efficiency of our, our particular uh, housing stock. As the Honourable Member would know that under Housing Nova Scotia, there are renovations taking place, Mr. Speaker, to in fact improve uh, the, the condition of that housing stock, Mr. Speaker. And what the Honourable Member knows but won't say, Mr. Speaker, is that this is the biggest improvement in the income security of Nova Scotians in years and in fact, Mr. Speaker, it's a heck of a lot more than the NDP ever did when they were in office. The Honourable Member for Colchester Muscadabit Valley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Agriculture. Um, a local hops producer in my constituency has raised concerns over the dwindling demand for locally grown products 
for use in the local craft beer industry. It had been hoped that with the growth of the craft brew industry in the province, supplier sales would increase and be more in demand. Uh, the opposite is proving to be true as supplies are being imported into our province. My question is, can the minister tell me what percentage of ingredients for the craft brew industry are purchased from outside the province and what percentage of hop usage is required to qualify as a made in Nova Scotia product? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you very much. That's a very good question. And indeed, I, I don't have the answer to the question today. I know hops are are uh, one thing that we really should grow more of in the province. We've tried to encourage some farmers to get into it. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to harvest and it's, it's one of the problems that we have with it. But I'll endeavour to get that information. The Honourable Member for Colchester, Muscadabit Valley. Oh. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. Uh, in contrast to craft beer, uh, suppliers for the wine industry have some protections and safeguards in place. Uh, in comparison, there are regulations in place to ensure that some ingredients are locally sourced. Uh, without something similar in place for the craft brew industry, millions of dollars are being spent outside of our province. So will the minister consider a similar approach for the craft beer industry to ensure there is at least some percentage of locally sourced ingredients? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I really would like to see all the ingredients from Nova Scotia. Reality is some of the grains and uh, barleys and one thing or another that they buy, we don't grow in Nova Scotia. So that, unless we can get a farmer who's very interested in doing small lots of that, it's very difficult. But we are working with the Craft Brewers and the Craft Brewers Association now to see if we can get more Nova Scotia content. It all, it's all going into our new program uh, where we're going to want more product produced in Nova Scotia for the local market. Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, mothers should never be separated from their newborn child. Recently, Laura Sonia gave birth to her second child, and after having a C-section, her newborn had to be airlifted to the neonatal ICU in the Moncton City Hospital. This mother was separated from her newborn child because there was no ambulance available to take her. She, after waiting 14 hours and messaging me, every hour through Facebook asking me to help her. The obstetrician gave her clearance for this mom to leave hospital and be driven by car to see her newborn and to be with her newborn. My question to the Minister of Health, will the Minister look into this problem of ambulances not being available when our people in Cumberland North and throughout the province so desperately need them? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, indeed, uh, that's uh, been a priority of mine within the department uh, and one that I've stressed uh, needs to be a priority with uh, our partners, uh, both uh, EHS uh, and uh, the Nova Scotia Health Authority and IWK. Uh, one of the uh, uh, predominant uh, themes, uh, not the only one, but a predominant theme uh, when having the discussion about uh, why uh, there'd be uh, challenges uh, with uh, uh, ambulance availability in some communities at specific points in time, again, recognizing the system is dynamic and, and shifts around to be there for uh, priority uh, emergency cases, uh, Mr. Speaker, that they're always available. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, the ambulance offload times was a, a concern one of the primary concerns that was brought to my attention. We gave direction. Lots of work has been done. We've seen uh, improvements in the uh, less than six months, I believe, uh, or about six months since uh, that work uh, began. We look forward to seeing continued improvements. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, this wasn't an offload problem. This was a problem that there was no ambulance available. That same night, I had a paramedic private message me to let me know that EHS the private company, Medivive, did not properly staff enough ambulances in our area that same night. Mothers should not be separated from their newborns, especially when their newborn is in a life-threatening situation. As a mother, I can't imagine anything really more stressful. Mr. Speaker, I want to know from the Minister of Health is what is his government doing to hold Medivive, a private company responsible for emergency services in this province? to make sure that there are proper emergency services and ambulances available when the people need them most. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank, 
Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, clearly, uh, all members uh, here uh, are, are in agreement uh, that, in, in fact, uh, the importance of ensuring uh, that the emergency uh, system is available and the uh, ambulances and the uh, qualified uh, paramedics and advanced care paramedics uh, that staff them are, are available and uh, uh, to prov provide their services, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my point about the offloads was that by improving, Mr. Speaker, the offload times, there have been uh, hundreds of hours and shifts uh, saved, Mr. Speaker, in just the last six months, which means those ambulances that were not waiting at a, at a, at a hospital to transition patients into uh, the uh, care of the hospital were back out in the community, Mr. Speaker, providing exactly that same care. And I want to assure the member, again, the priority in the EHS system is to ensure that ambulances do move around the province to ensure that they are there to respond to emergencies. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs. In the wake of Hurricane Dorian last month, some areas in Cape Breton didn't see their power restored for up to a week. The result were residents were hit in their pocketbook. It's straightforward, Mr. Speaker. No power means spoiled food and lots of it. One Cape Breton resident stated that she had a freezer and fridge full of food, which had to be thrown out to the tune of about $250. Mr. Speaker, that's a lot of money for most, and particularly for a, small, for a single parent on a low income. My question, Mr. Speaker, is with Christmas only a few months away, can the minister speak to any financial assistance, assistance my constituents can access to offset the costs of Hurricane Dorian? The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I certainly appreciate the question. Hurricane Dorian uh, was certainly had an effect. It uh, did see power outages in some areas for quite some time. Uh, I want to thank those who worked uh, diligently, Mr. Speaker, throughout that storm uh, right across this province and, and uh, our partners at Nova Scotia Power and others who, uh, who addressed those issues as quickly as they possibly could. We know, Mr. Speaker, there are concerns around that. We are assessing that damage still to this day. Uh, we hope to have uh, something in the near future uh, by way of an assessment and what might be available as we work through this process. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the Minister for that answer. Um, as well, not just residents in this province and in my constituency, but all, the power outage also affected small business owners. Businesses without power for days lost revenue and had to contend with delivery delays, not to mention spoiled perishables and the like. I'm sure those of, on the government side who've owned businesses know what a headache it was on top of all of the other stresses of running a business. So, Mr. Speaker, can the Minister tell small business owners in my riding what they can do to off help offset these losses? The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and again, I appreciate the uh, question from the Honourable Member. Um, again, we are assessing uh, the, the circumstances as we go through these uh, past few weeks. We'll continue to do that. At some point, uh, there will be... Uh, potentially will be a program that we may apply through the federal government, which we've notified them of that we may be interested in, the uh, Disaster Financial Assistance Program. Assessments are done, claims are filed, decisions are made at that level. Mr. Speaker, we have uh, um, provided some assistance through uh, contributions that have been made along with Nova Scotia Power to, to uh, feed Nova Scotia, et cetera. Those are things that doesn't cover everything. We know that, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there's more work to do. We'll continue to look at this and uh, hopefully have uh, more to speak on uh, once assessments are complete. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sydney River Myra Lewisburg. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As my colleague raised earlier this week, child poverty rates remain a major problem holding back families and livelihoods here in Nova Scotia. According to the, the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, there are 10 communities in Cape Breton with child poverty rates higher than 30%. I don't like to table that document. I feel that's very unacceptable and puts those communities at a very high risk of falling into a cycle of poverty from which they are increasingly unable to escape. My question for the Minister of Community Services is what evidence-based interventions is the government employing to ensure the rates of child poverty in Cape Breton will decrease substantially in the coming years? Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Community Services. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member uh, for this question. We want all Nova Scotians to be able to live uh, in a way that that is dignified, Mr. Speaker. And what I, I do want to let the Honourable Member know that in addition to increasing the standard of household weight, which will be coming in in January, which as I just previously indicated, uh, when annualized will be uh, three times the biggest <coughs> increase that we've ever given to income assistance, there are some other things that we're doing as well. So one of the things uh, that the Premier actually directed me to do was to stop uh, counting the income from maintenance uh, for, 
that, that mothers get from, from maintenance enforcement as income, Mr. Speaker. So now what's happened is about 1,500 ha uh, families in this province are now receiving an average of over $300 more per month because of the way we treat income. And that's just one of the things, Mr. Speaker, and I'll be happy to share more in my next answer. The Honourable Member for Sydney River Myra, Lewisburg. I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, my next question is actually to the Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Uh, many of the children facing dangerous levels of poverty face conditions just as bad when they reach the working age. In 2018, Statistic Canada reported an unemployment rate of 5.9% in Halifax. In Cape Breton, that same unemployment rate is 15.1%, so two and a half times the difference. And I feel this is unacceptable, my constituents feel that this is an unacceptable disparity. How does the government intend to bring the unemployment rate in Cape Breton down to a figure that is more in line with that of Halifax? Thank you. Honourable Minister of Labour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would like the member to know that in Cape Breton we do have um, employment centres which the members, which the residents of Cape Breton can go to. The employment centres help with, do with job attachment. As well, Mr. Speaker, we've seen uh, great success in all our universities, and UCB is one of them where we have sandboxes. And what is so great about sandboxes is that our youth are actually learning entrepreneurial skills, and as they apply those skills, they are actually creating jobs, creating wealth, and hiring people. Um, Mr. Speaker, as well in Cape Breton, we've, had, we've seen improvements in the unemployment rate, and although I do agree that the 15% is too high, we'll keep working towards uh, improving that rate, as we have with the rest of the province. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As we head into this Thanksgiving weekend, I would like to ask the members here to uh, ask themselves if they're going to go without a Thanksgiving dinner this weekend. In January 2019, the Deputy Minister of Community Services admitted in a CBC article that something appeared to be going wrong in the trend to overcome child poverty, meaning the rates were going up, Mr. Speaker. In 2015, the Canadian Centre for Policy Research reported that Cape Breton's two electoral districts of Sydney, Victoria and Cape Breton, Canso, landed in the first and in the third place for the highest child poverty rates in our province. And Nova Scotia has the highest child poverty rate in all of Atlantic Canada and we're third in the country. Mr. Speaker, I would like to ask the Minister, what kind of a comprehensive review has been done since that statement was made by the Deputy Minister, and what has she done to investigate and mitigate the known rise in child poverty rates, especially on Cape Breton Island? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for the question. As I indicated yesterday, um, when Statistics Canada came back with those particular uh, numbers, we were we were actually surprised, quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, because it flew the the numbers flew in the face of what we knew to be true, which was that the federal government had been making extensive investments in Nova Scotia in in. Uh, all across the province with their Canada Child Benefit. And I know that the average uh, the average household that, that is receiving this is getting over $5,000, Mr. Speaker. I wish I had the exact uh, numbers at my fingertips because I did have them at one point about the Cape Breton ridings. But what I can tell them, uh, tell the honorable member, is that $600 million came to Nova Scotia in the form of the Canada Child Benefit there. Uh, it's a federal program, and I, I'm happy to continue speaking about what we're doing Doing, but I did want to make the point that that's a significant investment in the youth of Nova Scotia. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Richmond. It may have been $600 million from the federal government, Mr. Uh, Speaker, but for whatever reason, that's not making a dent in the problem. Um, the community organizations in Cape Breton have always stepped forward, and it's time for this government to now step up and find out what's going wrong here. Food for Children in Cape Breton, in Richmond County, it's branched out. It's feeding children healthy snacks in schools. It's sending kids home with backpacks of food for the weekend. Our food banks struggle to keep their shelves stocked because the need is so great. I, and I urge us all this weekend to think about how many children will be hungry this weekend when we're all enjoying our Thanksgiving dinners. I'd like to know, in fact, if the minister, I'm going to change my trajectory here, I'd like to ask the minister to join me in a challenge this weekend. I'd like for her to go without food for two days so that she can feel at the very pit of her stomach what it's like for a child to go hungry. Will the minister commit to that? 
The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to point out that across Nova Scotia, 94% of our schools, in fact, do have school breakfast programs, Mr. Speaker. And that's... <laughs> And that is an improvement, Mr. Speaker. I, we have a number of programs that we offer. We have, we have just announced our Building Vibrant Communities uh, program, grant program, Mr. Speaker, which will allow, um, Mr. Speaker, uh, community organizations to, to do community gardens, to, to look at a number of programs that, uh, a number of issues that we see uh, where uh, poverty is, is uh, that are central to poverty, things like transportation, youth tra youth tra uh, transitions, things like that, Mr. Speaker. But most of all, Mr. Speaker, uh, this honourable member, whom I greatly respect, Mr. Speaker, for her, her to suggest that I don't know what it's like to be hungry, she has no knowledge of my background. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, on August 22, 2019, I reached out to the Housing Nova Scotia regarding a home repair grant for one of the seniors in my constituency, and Housing Nova Scotia responded by an email, and I'll table that. Their response was said, indicating that there was a current wait list of over a year. Furthermore, the application needed to be mailed in, which is acceptable for those who uh, have the ability to do that, but it would have been much more convenient for this senior to do so online. However, for those without internet access, um, that wouldn't be an option and, and we need rural internet to uh, provide that option for all communities. Can the minister tell me how many people got a home repair grant last year and how many people are still on the wait list? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Nova Scotia. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question. I don't have the number at my fingertips of how many grants went out. I do know that there were many, and I will endeavour to uh, provide that number to the Honourable Member, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, daily living activities that are intuitive and routine for all of us are extremely challenging and life-changing for frail seniors, especially for those living alone. And every year, about 33% of all seniors are going to have a fall. One of the technologies that helps to notify emergency services workers and family members if there is a fall is the fall sensor. There are a number of them available in the community and there is a grant program available to help low-income seniors, but the grant uh, is only useful for a very small number of people because the income threshold is so low. That income threshold has not been changed to my knowledge in a number of years. So I'll ask the minister responsible for this how many seniors are on the wait list for receiving one of these fall sensor buttons and how many of those would be eligible if the threshold was increased by about four or five thousand dollars a year? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I believe that's a, a program that falls uh, under uh, the health uh, purview, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I don't have the specific uh, answers to the, the member's question uh, that she raised uh, at my fingertips. They're very specific about a very specific uh, program. Uh, but uh, what I can assure the member is we continue to evaluate our programs, uh, make investments, uh, work that gets done throughout the year to evaluate programs and make decisions uh, come forward through the budget process. Uh, we identify uh, where we can invest uh, money and support uh, programs like that. Uh, programs, Mr. Speaker, like the uh, caregiver benefit uh, that supports uh, people at home. Mr. Speaker, the investments that we've made for home care supports broadly, uh, significant investments to the tunes of tens of millions of dollars over the past number of years. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on October 1st, I shared with the Minister that the Physio Department at Cobbacood Health Centre has the largest waste list in the service of, for the service in the province. In addition, the department was not able to assess or treat patients within the assigned category of periods. The minister responded about the orthopedic strategy and the investments that were made last year in the area of health care to expand clinics for patient benefits. As a result, Cobbacoo did receive an additional two physiotherapists at that time, but there's still a significant wait list. Mr. Speaker, my question is, will the minister again, or to the minister again, is will he commit to adding additional therapists to Cobbacoo to address the long wait list of residents residents of Sackville and Beaverbank and surrounding areas. The Honourable Minister of Health. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank uh, the member for the question. I appreciate uh, the acknowledgement, uh, Mr. Speaker, of the investments that we've been making uh, in uh, the area of uh, physiotherapy and, uh, and occupational therapy, Mr. Speaker, to support Nova Scotians in need, uh, not just in his community, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, but indeed in many communities throughout uh, the province that we've made those investments to help support uh, Nova Scotians. Order, please. Time allotted for oral questions put by members to ministers has expired. Just before we move on to government business, the Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I uh, just uh, know it's not part of the uh, regular uh, order of uh, business, but uh, with the uh, consent of the House, I'll table the uh, 811 report uh, that's been inquired about earlier today. Is it agreed? Is it agreed? It is agreed. The report is tabled. The Honourable Deputy Government House Leader. Uh, th <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Speaker. That concludes government business for today. I move that the House now rise to meet again on Tuesday, October 15th, 2019, between the hours of 1 p.m. and 6 p.m. Following the daily routine and question period, business will include second reading of bills number 189, 191, 192, and 193, and with time permitting, third reading of bills number 191. 52, 160, 163, 166, and 170. Also would like to advise uh, the members of the Law Amendments Committee and the general public that the Law Amendments Committee will be meeting on Tuesday, October 15th at 6 p.m. Uh, it will be considering bills numbers 169, 175, 177, 180, and 187. And before I take my seat, Mr. Chair, I want to uh, uh, wish all members of this House and all Nova Scotians a very, very happy Thanksgiving. Please enjoy uh, the precious time with your families and also to enjoy the bounty of our hardworking farmers and producers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Motion is for the House to adjourn, to rise, to sit again uh, Tuesday, October the 15th, between the hours of 1 p.m. and 6 p.m. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. Aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion is carried. The House is adjourned until Tuesday, October 15th at 1 p.m.